Hello and welcome to the latest installment of PSG Talking. I'm your host Ed and on today's show we're looking back at PSG's defeat to Dortmund in the Champions League and look ahead at how they can overcome the one goal deficit. Before we get started, let me remind you to subscribe to this show wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to PSG Talk Extra Time over on Substack and as always visit psgtalk.com for all your Paris Saint-Germain news. All right, joining me on the show today, we have Ethan from PSG Fan Club Boise. Ethan, thanks for coming on again. How are things on your end? Hey, thanks for uh, having me on. And yeah, it's going well. Other than that match, you know, it was pretty frustrating and we'll get into all that. But other than that, it's good. Uh, in a week, I will be, I'll be in Europe and I'll be at the park in just about eight days. So pretty excited for that. But uh, first, we have a, a, a semifinal to win. So... Yeah. yeah, just a little uh, match coming up next week on Tuesday. We had you on uh, before the match on Wednesday, just to kind of previewing it. I totally got that one wrong. We're going to get into it, but yeah. So I'm glad to have you on. We can recap what happened, look ahead, and then you can prepare for your trip to Europe. And uh, it's going to be a blast for you. So I'm excited for you. But let, we got to get into what happened uh, last Wednesday. So. Just a very ba- basic question, Ethan. Just from the play from PSG, do you think the guys even knew that they this was a semifinal of the Champions League? I mean, wh- what was that that we watched on Wednesday? Yeah, uh, the first 15 minutes, I, you know, I could see us starting slow. I was like, yeah, it's all right. You know, they'll, they'll get into it. And, you know, it's a, a very hostile atmosphere. You know, Dortmund has a great, great stadium and, and great fan base and great crowd. Um, but as the match went on, it just seemed like there was a little bit of a disconnect within the midfield, and I, I don't I don't know if I can quite pinpoint what that was, what the issue was. And then technically, it seemed like we were really poor. The first touch was poor, weren't dribbling well, and the passing especially was not was not very strong. So it was, um, yeah, it, it was weird. There were probably only two guys who I'd say had a great performance that day, um, and and I I would say if I did. Probably Marquinhos and and Vitinha, what I would say were were my best. Vitinha definitely for me. But other than that, everyone else was playing pretty lethargic. They were playing as if we were playing Lav uh, at the last weekend. So <laughs> a little yeah, Lav was, hangover. A Lav hangover. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe Lav is the best team in Europe. No, but um. Yeah, that's that's my initial thoughts. It was uh, it was weird. But what did you take from from that, especially from the the beginning of the match? I mean, I, I was I couldn't have been higher on the team going into this match. I thought on paper PSG are, are much better. They were the betting favorites. I you know they've played this team several times this season, so they're they're familiar with them. I didn't see any reason why PSG should have been played off the pitch or they should have been that distant of a second best in this match. I thought, of course, it could be a little tough, but I thought PSG's quality would eventually show through. And you, like you said, you just kind of looking at your watch. Okay, guys, let's. This is a semifinal. Let's let's get it going. And it they never switched into that gear that you see a, a team like Real Madrid, where they can shift into that gear, get the goals, and get the result that they need. PSG weren't able to do that. I, you know, we've seen them struggle this season on the road, so maybe we shouldn't be too surprised. But again, you just look at the quality that PSG had, and I thought Luis Enrique's starting lineup, I, the the French front three, Barcola, Mbappe, Dembele, love it, no issues there. I thought the midfield. We talked before. You thought maybe Ugarte, but I thought Fabian Ruiz. So again, I I had no issue with the midfield, and then I thought defensively, that's about the best back line that we that PSG could even uh, have out there, and of course Donnarumma. So I had no issues with the starting lineup. So I, I really can't place this on the manager. It's it just like the players didn't execute, and sometimes that's what happens. The players just don't play well. Yeah, that that's exactly what happened for me as well. It's uh, tactically, you know, we we weren't bad. I mean, if you look at the, you know, I'm I'm a numbers guy. Uh, on XG, it was basically dead even between the two teams. Um, it probably should have been two two if if you look at the stats in that way. That's probably how the game should have ended. Um, but yeah, it's just, like you said, nothing wrong with the starting lineup. I think we all knew that Fabian Ruiz was going to get the start there. Um, but he, he had a pretty poor day in a lot of, in a lot of facets. Um, his passing wasn't good. A couple defensive errors, not any crucial errors from what I remember, but, um, yeah, it was, it was just weird. I think a lot of people expected us to, 
I think a lot of people maybe expected um, – well, I'm not sure. I, you know, I've actually seen it both ways. Some people were expecting us to just sit back and then try and hit Dortmund on the counter as if they're unaware of our speed of the front three. And then some people thought that we would just be in Dortmund's uh, half the entire match and they would try and hit us on the counter. And, and it was it was more the second, the, uh, you know, than the first. You know, we, we had uh, seven, we had 57% possession and... And the major, a lot of the game was played in Dortmund's half, but between the two options, I, I think it was pretty clear that you know about 15 minutes in that all right, Dortmund's just going to try and hit us on on the counter for the most part, and they're just going to wait and and you know, and for once we saw a German team implement a really good low block. I feel like. To my memory, I, I can't remember a lot of times that, that German clubs have done that super well. Uh, I know that they usually struggle more to to beat a low block compared to other teams, but um, so it wasn't quite like the the craziest thing imaginable. But um, still, yeah, it was it was uh, just a weird. Yeah, we never got into a flow, like you said. Yeah, teams like I mean, even even the year that Chelsea won the Champions League a couple of years ago. Uh, we saw Christian Pulisic score in a Champions League semifinal in Madrid, and they just w- would not con- concede goals. And you're right, uh, the year that Bayern won it, they were super clinical. You know, back in 2020 when they played us in the final, they were super clinical. Uh, I don't think they lost a game that year. We've seen Real Madrid just the, and I tweeted right after the match that, and and all these teams that I just mentioned, they all have this in common. It's when they get in these tough games. They're they're really clinical. Like you see, very clinical finishing, and I think that's what separates that's what separates you know champions from teams in the hall of very good. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that phrase, but um, you know it's just that's that's what PSG is a lot of times. We're a very good team, but we're not a, a great team. And yesterday we just looked like a a very good team, whereas Dortmund they were doing just about everything right. So. Um, Which yeah. is so just, head scratching because this this isn't a really good Dortmund team. I was looking at the table; they're in fifth place in the Bundesliga, behind Leipzig and Stuttgart. And I mean, I, I feel like they've had a somewhat easy road to get here um, in the Champions League. And I'm just this isn't maybe the the really top Dortmund size that we've seen in the past. And so again, I just I'm, I'm like. We've got Kylian Mbappe, and and I want to touch on him for a second because every stage that we've been okay here, Mbappe masterclass incoming. Here we go. He's gonna he's gonna score the goals. Here we go. And hey, once again, he was kind of taken out of the game. I mean, what is that credit to Dortmund or is this Mbappe fatigue or what's going on with him? Because he he's not scoring the important goals. Um, he's not making the impact that PSG needs. He's getting double, triple teamed and understood. It's it's difficult, but if you're the best player in the world. You know, it's not like Messi wasn't getting double and triple team and he figured it out. So what do we make of it? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a tough question. It could go a few ways, but um, I think the first thing that might have hurt, and I get that Luis Enrique probably wanted to have Barkola on the left to give a little bit of – um, defensive support to Nuno Mendes, who who was he up against? Was he up against Jaden Sancho on that? Yeah, side? he was up against Sancho, who yeah. had I think like he, ele- no, he like was a man of the dribbles, match, but he had a great yeah. he had a great game. Yeah, yeah, he had like eleven successful dribbles, which is one of the highest in that Champions League game ever, something like that. Um, so I get that he wanted to do that, but um, and I get that you know the away goals doesn't exist anymore, so it's not a big deal that that we didn't get an away goal. But if, I mean, just at a certain point in the game, you're thinking, I don't know. It, it's just because at this point, all the players have been saying it too. You know, it's halftime of this tie. It's it's halftime and now we're about to play, you know, the second half at our home. So I get at a certain point you're thinking, well, let's just see if we can get a goal, get a draw, but let's not go down two, you know, kind of a thing. But I'm still thinking uh, Mbappe on the left – could have offered, you know, more freedom. I mean, he we know that he's not like a true nine the way that Erling Holland or Gonzalo Ramos uh, are, or or any any guys like that. 
he likes to play a little bit wider, and that just left us without uh, a true nine in the middle of the box for a couple of our good chances. And to try and compensate for that, we saw Fabian Ruiz, of all people, who's a you know central midfielder, sometimes even our holding midfielder, running into the box trying to get his head on some of these balls. And he, he did on a couple of them, but didn't score. And... Um, just kind of a weird. So it's it's a tough dilemma between do you do you put Mbappe on the left next match and start you know Ramos or hopefully not Komwani but you know someone other you know do something different than what we just did or do you stick with because you know we our expected goals was one point seven on Wednesday that's not bad I think in the game that we knocked out Barcelona I think our xG was around the same number it's just we were clinical. We, we scored four goals off of the same amount of chances, essentially, whereas on Wednesday we scored none. So it's, <clears throat> it's uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a bit of a tough one, but um, Dortmund were really strong defensively, obviously, and um, yeah, it's just, I don't, I don't know if we're going to do something different. I don't know if Luis Enrique is going to decide that that, you know, a lot of changes have, I don't know. It, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the second leg, but yeah, um, I, I wrote a piece over on, um, on our Substack page. You talk extra, extra time of, of things that I would do. And I think we've seen Mbappe centrally along, you know, a little bit closer to Dembele. We've seen that work at times clearly against Dortmund. That's not working. So I like, let's push Mbappe into the Barcola role on the left wing. And then centrally, I think, Gonzalo Ramos. He he's just scoring at too high of a clip right now to leave him on the bench. We we saw that header that he had, and so he, he provides that aerial threat. He's scoring goals. I would put him in there and just see what he can do. Because clearly PSG need need goals. So let, let's put him in there. You know, I think he can be dangerous on set pieces. He gives PSG a little bit something different. And then maybe Mbappe would be a little bit more comfortable out there, and, and he and uh, Nuno Mendes can sort of have those overlapping runs. So I think that's one major change that I would make. It seems like maybe you were leaning that way. Do you think we'll see it? Yeah, I do. I think we'll see it. Oof. Um. Gosh, I don't know. It's it's just tough because, you, like you said, Gonzalo Ramos has has not had a lot of minutes in the Champions League this year. I think he's played. About 150 of, of a possible, you know, 990 minutes. So it's a it's a weird thing. But um, and originally when the match started and the lineups were out, I was like, all right, I like this lineup. You know, you spoke on that uh, earlier in this episode. We like the lineups, um, especially because Dortmund. You know, they have they have tall center backs. Their center backs that were starting were, I think, both six four, something like that. But we clearly saw it at a certain point in the match with Ruiz getting his his head on a couple crosses. And we're not a particularly strong crossing team. I mean, within the Champions League, our crossing accuracy is is near the bottom. Um, I looked it up yesterday. It's actually 27th of the 32 teams that were in the group stage. Um, And a lot of teams above us were teams like Union Berlin and Antwerp who got grouped. Um, so those teams can, can cross better than us. But um, what we've seen a couple times with Gonzalo Ramos this year is if, if you just loft up like a very, um, you know, like a very average looking like what you imagine when you think of a cross, you know, it, the ball probably gets 10 feet in the air and then comes down. That's something that might not beat Dortmund's center backs. But what was beating their center backs on Wednesday were all these whipped in crosses these crosses that were low they were about head or chest height and it was you know it was it was trying to put us in front of these these defenders with really good timing and that's exactly on on both of Ruiz's headers if we can replicate that but with Gonzalo Ramos there instead of Fabian Ruiz I promise you at least one of those goes in so if if Lucho thinks that that he can replicate that at the park, then then he could be onto something. The thing is that um, my my one concern with that is, like I've said, we're not a great crossing team. Statistically, only Dembele and uh, I believe Kengen Lee are our guys that cross at any sort of frequent rate, and Kengen Lee is probably not starting. 
Well, I, I, I had that in my piece as well. I mean, could you take Fabian Ruiz out if you want to go really attack minded and move, you know, Kang and Lee there? It's an option. Yeah. You, you suffer defensively, but maybe it's the roll of the dice PSG needs. Yeah, I think maybe as a as a sub later on in the second leg. But you gotta think, we're just down one goal and and you know, I kind of felt the way that a lot of fans were at, right after the you know that day uh after the match that man we just let a huge opportunity go whereas some people couldn't be less phased by this result i mean you look at dortmund's dortmund haven't lost any of their last 11 matches in the champions league going back to three seasons but their away record they only have two or three wins in their last 11 so you have to think you know home field advantage is is not a massive thing in in a lot of sports but you could argue, and I know, I think uh, Mark Damon has said this, that he, he believes that, that uh, football is probably the, the one sport where if you really want to take advantage of, of playing at home, then that's the one to do it. And so, yeah. I, I don't know, all things considered, we probably shouldn't be too worried, but it was hard to feel like we hadn't just kind of wasted an opportunity to, I mean, we could have won that game had we been as clinical as we were against Barcelona. Mm-hmm. And so it's um, it's just tough. We're making it a little tough on ourselves. But um, I'm, I'm not too worried. The thing is, if we score the first goal on, um, on Tuesday, mm-hmm. then I feel like everyone's going to feel as if we're, we're going to advance because the, it'll be tied on aggregate. We will have the crowd behind us. We'll have the momentum in that match. And the thing is, if we go down two goals, I mean, yeah, obviously the odds will be against us at that point. But um, but you have to think, I mean, we did this against Barcelona with 50 minutes left in our season, basically. And we did it at Barcelona, and we scored four goals in about 53 minutes. So it's it's possible even if we don't score the first goal. But um, you got to think if, if we do, then, then we're going to be in a great spot. Um, a uh, random last little bit that I sure. want to say on this is uh, the Opta Analyst. That's one of those advanced analytics sites. They, they've been getting into a lot of football numbers lately. They said that even after you know using their supercomputer, however they do that, using their supercomputer, PSG had a 49.7% chance to advance. So they're basically saying it was 50-50. I mean, for Dorman, they gave them 50.3%. They're basically saying the tie is, is still 50-50 if you, if you use advanced analytics. And, of course, advanced analytics can be wrong. 90 minutes is not a massive sample size and, and you know, just takes one little slip up or, or one little mistake to, to turn the whole tie on its head. But um, according to the numbers, I mean, if you look at everything, uh, I, I mentioned Dortmund's home record in the UCL lately. You look at our home record in the UCL lately. And it, it looks like for me, it's probably 65, 35 in my head of us advancing. So um, not too worried yet. As long as we get that first goal, I feel like we've been in a good spot, but um, I went on a little bit there, but I want to no. know. You dropped any- in some knowledge. I, I liked all the advanced analytics. Um, I just want to go back to something you said about Mark Damon and, and, and soccer football, the, the home field advantage i definitely would agree with that and and it really applies to a lot of like role players you know your superstars are your superstars they're they're probably going to do well no matter where they are but being at home being comfortable having that crowd support it always seems to we see it you know now in the especially in like the nba playoffs. some of these role players seem to always shoot a little bit better when they're at home and i feel like there's probably something to be said about that with dortmund and some of their role players maybe elevating their game i would be shocked if Dortmund came into the Parc de Prince and had a similar performance. I, I think that is about as well as they've played all season. And, and I think PSG, you could argue that was the second worst performance all season, maybe the first being when they went to Newcastle, and that was just a train wreck. So I don't think PSG are going to be as bad, and I don't think Dortmund is going to be as good. Now, like you said, can PSG take uh, their chances and score? I was just watching some of the highlights again, and you know there was Dembele had a really good opportunity, Fabian Ruiz, and I think it was Mbappe had hit the the post. PSG hit the post twice, so if if they can just capitalize on those chances, I think we're going to be good. Um, you talked a little bit about defensive efforts, and I, that's where I want to go next. My first part is um, 
who do you blame for Dortmund's first goal? It was a pass over the top. Dortmund was, were on their side of the pitch, just lobbed the ball over, and Nicholas Fulkrug was just timed his run perfectly. Initially, I thought he was offside, and then I, I finally saw the replay, and he was like a, a finger length just staying on sides. It was really an incredible run and great touch. He was able to finish. It was Lucas Hernandez who was there trying to catch up to him, and I think that may have been when he tore his ACL. We'll talk about that in a second, but who do you blame for that defensive lapse there? Yeah, you know, I can't remember the exact um, the the highlight exactly, but my initial thought was that it was Lucas Hernandez that was on that. Um, Marquinhos is at least, and it could have been Marquinhos. I could be wrong. I just I need to look back at it, but Marquinhos is a quicker center back than Lucas Hernandez. Yeah. And if if Marquinhos really let full Krug slip by him, then I'd be pretty dang surprised. But it was just a, a case of, I think PSG maybe thought that we were going to have relentless pressure and sit in Dortmund's half the entire match kind of a thing. Um, not as extreme as I think our mindset going into the Newcastle game away, you know, the 4-1 early in the year. But but somewhat similar, and uh, I feel like it just kind of put us off tactically. But uh, if I, yeah, from what I recall, I think Lucas Hernandez just the the line was high. I mean, it was a great pass. I don't even know who had the assist for uh, Dortmund. Do you know? Let's see who was it. It was. Well, well you look it up. I was just watching yeah. the replay. You probably could hear me clicking around, and I, I can't tell who it was that was kind of marking full Craig, but they they cared more about raising their hand for offside which is my ultimate pet peeve i oh you, do you think like officials you know or referees are going to raise their flag because you raised your hand i i've never understood that put your hand down and, and guard guard the man like stay with him and then like you see full Krug just run past the the psg defender and the guy who got beat is just kind of jogging, raising his hand as if like he knows that the guy's offside is like, actually, he's not. It would be nice if you sprinted just like Lucas Hernandez did. I mean, it, it's just really poor effort. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Ram, the assist was from Nico Schlotterbeck, but um, <clears throat> I thought it was from someone else. But, uh, you know, I feel like you and I had a similar conversation about – uh, or maybe it wasn't you, you and I. Maybe it was you and and someone else. But I remember you saying this on on a PSG Talk podcast when we got eliminated by Real Madrid a couple years ago. And on that goal, that um, uh, I think it was the the false, you know, the the fake. It wasn't. I still think it was a probably a foul. Uh, but on Donnarumma from Karim Benzema. And I think it was on that goal you said the guys were just kind of putting their hand up thinking, hey, like, where's the yes. foul? And oh it's like, God. no, the ref hasn't blown the whistle yet. And we just kind of sat around. And yeah. uh, no one was, was really watching. Everyone, and everyone at that point was kind of ball watching, waiting for a whistle to blow. And then as soon as um, – I don't even know who uh, – well, Benzema scored it. I don't even know who assisted him. But whoever assisted him, everyone was just staring at him, and he just dumps it off to, to Benzema, who got wide open again. It's like as soon as he won the ball off of Donnarumma, uh, or forced the the air by Donnarumma, uh, then everyone just kind of forgot he existed and, and stopped watching him. It's kind of kind of the same yeah. thing. That's that's yep. what your your line right there just reminded me of. Exactly. So. I'm watching. It looks like it's Fabian Ruiz. Actually, he gets beat, and you see Marquinhos. His face, he's like grinning and he's sprinting as fast as he can. Lucas Hernandez is running as fast as he can and ultimately ends up tearing his ACL. And there's Fabian Ruiz just, you know, I'm just going to run and raise my hand. Come on, listen to me. And it's just kind of like no effort whatsoever. It's like you just got beat. I know you're not a defender, but like can you track back? Can you he's run? A, he, he, There's no he, one back there. Do he's something. Basically, he's, ba- he's basically our holding midfielder, which means he, he's <sighs> – He's our, essentially our third most important defender on the pitch uh, at a lot of times. But I don't know if I've got anything else on on that goal uh, except that I think it's weird that Dortmund just played Route 1 football mm-hmm. and and beat us on that. But Like Newcastle um, did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
And it's, I think it's also, I don't, we're probably going to talk about this a little yeah. more in the future and we can dive into it now if you want, but Lucas Absolutely. Hernandez. Yeah. Let's get to him. Uh, we should just say the news that came out yesterday, torn ACL out six, seven months. It's on the other knee. So he had an ACL tear, uh, before joining PSG. Um, and then now he's got the other knee is, is blown out. So he'll be out for six, seven months. And let's just, before we get into what it means and all that full credit to, I mean, he gave his all. I think he kept playing, even though he had the torn ACL. He, you can't question his determination, his his want to uh, perform at a high level for PSG. So anyone who had questions, and maybe I was one of them at the beginning of the season, I thought, I don't know about this guy. He left it all out there for us, and, and he's been a fabulous player for PSG this season, and, and hopefully he has a speedy recovery. But take it from there. I mean, what does that injury mean for PSG? Yeah, and you know, I'm glad that you said that. Yeah, he played for four or five more minutes on that ACL before he just kind of, kind of finally went down. Um, and you know, like you said, he he's torn the ACL on his other knee. He probably knew that he had torn it, or he at least you know was thinking this this is somewhat similar to what happened at the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. Um, but he kept playing for a few minutes. So, yeah, I was in that same boat. You know, oh, he's from Marseille. And, and you know, people had supposedly had recordings or, or evidence of him being a Marseille fan, something like that. Um, but, no, he – yeah, he was truly – he's maybe been our our signing of the season if, if you exclude the attack. So, yeah. yeah, great effort from him. Love to see – yeah, he, he proved me wrong this year because I was with you. I didn't have a lot of high hopes. Well, the him. goal came in the 36-ish minute, yeah. um, and he ended up being taken off in the 42nd. And when yeah. I watched the replay, I think that last-ditch effort trying to stop the goal is is where the injury happened. You can yeah. sort of see his knee buckle. He goes down, and he, and he holds his knee almost immediately. I, so mm. that's how he goes out, trying to stop you know, a goal, not – not just running around or, or, I mean, he, he was giving, he was the only person who gave a shit and tracked back and tried to stop the goal. Now, yeah. Fabian Ruiz, he was raising his hand. It was Lucas Hernandez who was, he gave his all. And then yeah. you, just, you can only applaud it. Yeah. You, yeah. You can. And, uh, and what it means for the team is, I mean, at, at this point of the season, it was pretty clear our, our best center back pairing was going to be Marquinhos on the right, Lucas Hernandez on the left. And now it's, you know, Lucas Hernandez is out. If we end up making the Champions League final, then we're going to be doing it with essentially a backup center back. And we saw Beraldo got subbed on uh, there. I, I don't. He didn't play really poorly. He he had a couple bad passes, um, but he didn't do anything that that you know resulted in another goal. I mean, just think about it. Hey, we're going to sign you in January. We know you've never played in the Champions League, you never played European football before, but we need you to step in in a semifinal uh and potentially a Champions League final. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that after the match. Um I was thinking, wow, if well, no, sorry, it was the next day as soon as we knew that that Hernandez had uh, it was an ACL tear. I was thinking, wow, if we go to a Champions League final, then yeah, this dude was um you know, probably making, which of course this is not bad money. It's great money, but he's probably making what five hundred grand in Sao Paulo in December, and then now he he's making probably ten times that. Lives in Paris, and and it will probably start as the center back in a Champions League final if we make it. So at yeah. the park, I mean, the atmosphere is going to be incredible. Uh huh. And he gets to go out there. I mean, yeah, he, but. We've seen him play well. We've also seen him have a little bit of dip in form here recently. I, mm-hmm. if you look, we'll get to the preview, but if you look ahead, he he has to be solid. He's got to be solid at the back. Yeah, yeah, he does. Because I think even if we're we're on fire on uh, on Tuesday, you know, I, I think if we're later when we probably do match predictions, I highly doubt you or you or I are going to say that we're scoring five goals. <laughs> so really, if you know, if we allow more than one goal in in the match on Tuesday, then our odds of going through are are pretty low. So you know, one goal or a clean sheet, you know, allowing one goal or a clean sheet is probably manageable. That will likely send it to at least extra time. Um, but but two or more goals, and uh, we're probably out 
just statistically speaking. So, yeah, we're going to need him to be good, although we, we might get into – is it going to be Danilo or maybe mm. Milan Skriniar? It's, it's tough to say. I'm I don't not know. Sure, but if you look at PSG's recent results, you know, at home against Real Sociedad, they scored two um, against Barcelona. They lost that one, but they did score two goals. I'm just trying to see where they – have they been – has PSG been blanked at home this season? I feel like it did happen. They beat AC Milan 3-0 at home. Uh, if you're talking in the Champions League, Yeah, just no. Champions League, yeah. No, um, no, because let's think. Match day one, Dortmund, we scored twice. Yep, 2-0. Yep, no. Milan, we scored two or three. And then Newcastle, we scored one. Mm-hmm. That late one that's that controversial that yeah. people are still talking about. We should have scored gosh. two in that game. <laughs> so we, is, I, I think yeah. it's safe to say PSG are going to score goals. Almost At truly, least yeah. I, I think you could pencil them for one. So now we got a 1-1 game. They're, they're going to score a goal. And then it's just can they keep Dortmund quiet and score at least one more? Their record would tell us they're probably going to score two. They've scored two against teams better than Dortmund. Um, it's just can – can it all come together? There's going to be a lot of pressure. The fans are going to be there. I can't. I can't wait to see what the tifo is. Uh, the supporters. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be great because you know you had the stat. What was it? How many years since PSG supporters have seen a semifinal Champions League? You know, in the stadium. Uh, yeah, uh, twenty eight years. Yeah, twenty eight years. We we know what happened back in twenty twenty. Um, PSG were down a goal to Dortmund. They come back to the park with no fans and uh, were able to beat them. So. History is on PSG's side. They know they can score goals. Hernandez is out, but he was never going to score goals. We've got Baraldo, who is a very good uh, replacement. Not as good, but he he we've seen him play. Like he he can do the job. I guess we can start to get into a little bit of the preview here. And we talked some about maybe Gonzalo Ramos coming in, but when you look at the starting lineup, what would you change? Either players or maybe tactically. What what is the mindset you think Luis Enrique will have? Man, it's it's tough. Um, as far as whether we start Ruiz or Ugarte, that's something I'm wondering. Um, I think we should probably stick with Ruiz because uh, he's better on the ball at this point. You know, if we were trying to hold on to a lead, then I'd I'd want Ugarte in. But um, which I wanted Ugarte in last time, uh, you know, on Wednesday, but it, it ended up being Ruiz, and um, I don't think Ruiz was responsible for that goal. But maybe he was, and if so, I wonder if Ugarte would have done differently. Who knows? Although he's not the fastest either. But um, as far as tactically, if it was up to me, you know, and and obviously Luis Enrique knows ball a lot better than me. Um, I've never managed football at any level other than football manager on my computer. But uh, and he's won the trouble, so he's going to know better than me, but I, I want Mbappe on the left. I want Bart, uh, sorry, Ramos in, in the middle. Other than that, midfielders stay the same. The, the lineup staying the same. I've um, seen some shouts for maybe like Dembele as a false nine Mbappe on the left wing. And then on the right wing, maybe you bring King and Lee. Yeah, it, maybe it, it, it's, it's tough. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a tactical wizard by any means, but I, I wonder if uh, – I don't know. It's just if if Dortmund hit us with as good of a low block as we saw um, on Wednesday, then that that could be great. I'm just sort of thinking that – not that, not that uh, in the Real Madrid-Bayern match, not that Vinicius was playing as a false nine. I don't think he was, uh, but – when he on the first goal that he scored, he dropped. I don't know if you're watching. He dropped pretty deep, and he he kind of not forced, but he he got uh, Byron's center back Kim Min Jae, the South Korean, uh, to follow him, and then he just cuts right up field. Great through ball from Tony Cruz, and that's the kind of thing. If, if a false nine, if we really think that it's going to pull a center back at a position frequently, then it might not be a bad idea. I just don't, I don't, I don't know if uh, Dortmund are going to fall for it. I mean, Koble's a good shot stopper, not statistically as good over the last couple of years as Donnarumma, but uh, he was certainly better on, um, on Wednesday. But if, if they're going to allow us space in, in that zone, right at the top of the box 
and just kind of say, hey, try and uh, we'll, we'll give you this and try and beat us with, with outside the box shots. They might try that. And I don't think it'd be a, a great idea. I think we could definitely, if you give Mbappe three or four open shots, the outside of the box, you know, somewhat open shots, he'll probably score one. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tough to say as far as tactics, yeah. man, I, I don't, I don't know what we got to do, but, uh, the way that we, however we can replicate those whipped crosses to Ruiz, I think would be, would be great. Especially if we're going to have someone like Ramos there, he'll probably get his head on those. Or if we ever see sometimes, I mean, we know how bad we are on set pieces, but if we're going to go, uh, and you, you remember that goal and it wasn't quite, it wasn't just like a, a headed goal from a from a whipped in cross that got in front of the defense. But you remember that goal in the snow against Bayern a couple years ago? And it was Neymar with that insane pass to Marquinhos yeah, of all people. Marquinhos yeah, was remember. playing up top for a second. If Marquinhos is good in the air, and I don't know who the other center back will be. If it's Skriniar as well, then we'll actually have an aerial threat a bit, especially if Ramos plays. But um, if it's... If it's Baraldo or Danilo, like I'd expect, then Marquinhos is really the only guy who will have, outside of maybe Ramos if he starts, that has an aerial presence. So every once in a while, if if we're not fearing uh, the threat of a counterattack, then Marquinhos with these weird runs in the box, we've seen it before. Um, we've seen it on set pieces in the past. I think in our last semifinal uh, that we won – because you know we we played Man City in 2021 but lost, but the one against Leipzig, that one match semifinal in uh, Portugal, pretty sure Marquinhos scored there. So, and he's been he's been really not that these quite translate, but he's been really on it defensively lately. I mean, he probably prevented a goal in I believe the second half of yeah, it was a sliding block uh-huh. that he had. It was really really good. We've seen I've we've seen dozens of those slide tackles in the past that um for example the second one the second goal of the Real Madrid comeback against us uh, a couple years ago he was same thing Marquinhos was there and he slid and he went airborne with with both legs and unfortunately for him he happened to leave just enough space between his legs for a football to fit between and that's exactly where Kareem Benzema's shot went even took a slight deflection and didn't change its trajectory, but it still went in. We've just seen so many slide tackles like that in the past where Marquinhos is there. There's no reason that this shouldn't get blocked or he shouldn't get a piece of uh, of this. And yet it, it squeezes right between his legs or it takes a deflection and goes in. So, um, yeah, kind of off topic from, you know, aerial threat, but Marquinhos is... Uh, he's been just really, really solid defender lately, and I hope he can keep it up with these these tackles of you know fortune going his way, and he's he's in the right spot, and he's not having these these weird fluke or freak coincidence where he's making the tackle, but some deflection or the ball squeezes right in between his legs, kind of a thing. I hope he can keep that up because that that'll be big. Because if if we're playing pretty free and open. We don't have the best defense in the world. I think we've keep uh, we've we've had three clean sheets in the last fourteen matches, something like that. Um, you know, we're winning most of our games this this point of the season, like three to one or four to one. So Dortmund are gonna have shots. They're they're gonna have chances on Tuesday, almost surely, unless they just don't show up. Um, so yeah, Marquinhos being on, and then whoever that other center back is with him. They're they're gonna have to be very very good. I'm with you. Um, and it, we said at the top of this that I, I love the starting lineup. So if Luis Enrique said let's run it back with this, I think it would be uh, you know outside of um, Luis Hernandez obviously. But I, I don't have too many complaints. I just think some players had poor performance. Maybe yeah. they were intimidated. Who knows? Who knows what it would what, what it was? But I, I think that there's no way that this team plays any worse than they did at home. So if they kept it the same, fine. I do like. Moving Mbappe to the left, put Gonzalo Ramos in there because all he does is score goals. I like, you know, Baraldo for Hernandez in there. And then Fabian Ruiz is the one that you consider, you know, do you put him in there and say, look, everywhere Julian Brandt goes, you go and you just stop him? Because he he was sort of making all the plays for uh, Dortmund, him and yeah. Jaden Sancho. And so you just say, kind of keep an eye on both of those and try to limit there. So I, I wouldn't be opposed to that, but. 
again, if it's Fabian Ruiz, we've seen him have good performances as well in the Champions League. So it's going to be interesting. Like you said, Luis Enrique is one of the trouble. So who am I to tell him anything? I, I thought the lineup was really good. I think we're going to get a better performance. Will it be enough? We'll have to see. Um, the one thing I will say is that I, I think Dortmund's going to be a little bit disappointed. You, when you consider how well that they played and how poor PSG were, to only have a one-goal lead to win 1-0 is probably not where they would expect to be. Um, they're going to be a little bit nervous. They're going to be forced to come out, and maybe that plays into PSG's hands in, in that, that they can hit on the counter potentially. right? Because I don't think Dortmund can just sit in that low block for 90 minutes and I'm- just... Just going to mention the same thing. Yeah, there's thing no way that, that they can do it. Go ahead, take it from there. Yeah, there's there's no. I think they would be if they come out and they park the bus as a Bundesliga team parking the bus from the beginning of the match. That would be really surprising. Um, and yeah, we. I mean, if they do that, as long as we limited their counterattacking possibilities. I mean, the thing is, Adiemi and Sancho and Julian Brandt, they're they're all very good, but. If they're going to commit all three of those guys plus full crew forward on on counters, then uh, you have to think how you know how low of a block is that really? Because then they've just got their how low are the last six outfield players? So it's um, yeah, I don't see them just sitting in a low block the whole match. I mean, There's no do way. Do they really expect thirty five year old Mats Hummels to have the same kind of performance? I I just don't think so. I mean, and, and let's yeah. we can't understate this enough i mean this could be mbappe's last champions league match in a psg shirt he's not going to want to go out with a whimper i think he's going to have his targets locked on hummels and he's going to terrorize them for 90 minutes that, i mean that's that's what yeah. i that's what i'm hoping mm-hmm. i just don't think there's any way that hummels is going to have that level of a performance again that's fair yeah and um i i i had a post on on twitter a couple weeks ago or i think it was last week saying if you think about it, Mbappe is, you know, two or three Champions League master classes away from the Ballon d'Or and being a Champions League winner. And so, you know, we didn't get one the other day. So if he's if he and, and he's been better in the second leg of, you know, in the second leg against Sociedad, he was better than the first leg. In the second leg against Barcelona, he was better than than the first. You know, he had a he had a, uh, the the penalty goal and um, and the late goal that kind of just fell to him with a weird uh, clearance from Barcelona. But but outside of those, he was very very good in that match. So you'd have to think um, that he's due due for one. And I totally agree. He I just I get that you know the best player in the world. Sometimes I mean we've seen in the past we've seen how. Messi and Barcelona have kind of got blanked. Um, we've seen, you know, outside of, of Real Madrid, we saw how Ronaldo had, had kind of got shut down in the Champions League at times. But, but more often than not, when when there when there were tight games and it was in the big moments, these those dudes usually delivered. And if Mbappe wants to, I mean, he is the best player in the world. But if he's if he's really trying to cement this this legacy that he is top five or top ten of all time then it's it's a match like this one coming up where yes if, if he gets a you know two goal contributions a goal and an assist or however you know whatever combo you want to do there two goals or two assists if he can get two goals uh you know contribute to two goals which i think mm-hmm. is extremely doable for him on tuesday then all of a sudden we're probably going to be almost surely going to be just one match away from Champions League winners, probably treble or quadruple winners if you count the the French Super Cup. And, yeah, it's just you got to think from Mbappe, yeah, like the Euros are coming up. And it's not that he the, – the only thing he cares about is the Ballon d'Or. Clearly not. I'm sure that he would take winning the Champions League this year over winning the Ballon d'Or uh, if, you know, which I know those would sort of go hand in hand, but if, if they didn't, then you know he'd take winning the Champions League. Um, but yeah, you got to think that he's 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 due for one. Yeah, I agree. There's no way that he goes out with a whimper uh, with with this team. I mean, in the past, I mean, think think Bayern uh, eliminating us last year. We went out with a whimper in that one. Uh, 
Yeah. But the team was was not good. Galtier was losing the team by then already. We just the midfield was not good. Vitinha Messi was had walking not, around. Vitinha had not figured out yet. Like mo- two, at least two of our three attackers were walking around. <laughs> I remember at one point Neymar. You remember Neymar got so frustrated. It was actually in the first leg at the Parc des Princes. Neymar got so frustrated at one point that he was r- sprinting around. Yes, trying yeah, to track. I remember that. <laughs> I remember I was in the stadium for that and watching that live. Um, my buddy and I, we were like, "Is that is that Neymar doing that?" We kind of laughed. Like <laughs> it's like, dude, we could we could tell, and we were on the uh, far side of the stadium up in the nosebleeds and we could tell from a hundred, 150 yards away. We were like, Neymar is really pissed right now. So you have to think Mbappe, if we're losing at a certain point, Mbappe has got to do that same thing. Like we're going to see him press. We're going to see him track. We're going to see a very pissed off man. If it looks like we're getting knocked out uh, later in the match. So that's just what I thought of. I think we're going to see Mbappe running around and you know, his work rate is going to be like a madman if uh, if it's getting towards the closing stages and we're still on course to be eliminated. And I think for that Ballon d'Or, we don't know how, what importance Mbappe places on that. I'm sure it's it's pretty high. He'd like to win it. He, he can't lose this game. He can't – we're not playing prime Barcelona. This isn't yeah. Real Madrid. This isn't Manchester City. Like mm-hmm. you should be able to get this PSG team with a really good – midfielder in Vitinha, you've got Dembele, you, you've got some good players around you. You don't have to do it all yourself, but you got to get to the final. And I think if he could just get PSG to the final, which no one expected, if you win it, then I think he's in the lead for the Ballon d'Or. Even if he loses it, depending on what he does at the Euros, I still think he could win it. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But if he if he goes out with a whimper again, um, I think he can kiss that one goodbye because I think Vinicius and Jude Bellingham and there's some probably other names I'm forgetting that are probably you know doing a lot more for their team right now. So the pressure's on for Mbappe right now, but it's yep. not an insurmountable mountain to climb. Um, no, it's, it's one goal, it's, and I yeah. think for me tactically, you get an early goal, then you start putting some doubt into Dortmund. You, then you get the crowd really excited. So if PSG can get a goal, I'm going to say in the first 10, 15 minutes. If that happens, I think then PSG supporters can breathe a sigh of relief, and I, I think things are going to go PSG's way. Yeah, I, I, you have to get an early goal because then I think then you're going to start drawing Dortmund out a little bit more. You're going to stretch them out, and then I think you can use PSG's speed. And I thought that like a lot of the you know passing wasn't as crisp, but I thought the touches. There was a moment Barkla just leapt in the air and was able to control the ball. Uh, Vitinho I thought was really sharp, so I. I, I think PSG can play the quick one twos and be really sharp and beat this Dortmund side. But it's uh, if they can just get an, an early goal with everything else uh, for the rest of the game, I think it's going to be a little bit easier. So, give me a prediction, Ethan. What do you think? What's the scoreline? Does PSG get to the Champions League final? Yeah, I think they do. I think it's going to be three one on Tuesday. I think we get the first goal. Um, maybe we get the second after. I think we'd even get the second after that. And then, um, and you know, we, we might get, I, I could really see us getting three straight and going up 3-1 on aggregate and then maybe Dortmund pull one back. But um, I think 3-1 is uh, what I'm going to go with. Yeah. Wow. Usually I'm the, the optimistic one. I'm going to go with a familiar scoreline, 2-0. I think 2-0 gets it done. We had it early against Dortmund in the group stage, so why not again? 2-0. Nice. We'll go with it, Mbappe, Brace. Yeah. Why not? And uh, So I think we both think PSG can advance. So if you're listening to this and you felt like maybe it was all doom and gloom, it, just know this. We both think that PSG can in, uh, advance, and you would hope over two legs that PSG's quality will eventually shine through. You would hope Luis Enrique would have seen what happened, and he would go back to the drawing board and figure some things out, because I do think he's a, a better manager than Terzic, who... It's a little bit like uh, Jurgen Klopp there on the sideline. He, he was kind of rubbing me the wrong way. I don't know how you felt that just the overhead clapping, the jumping, and everything's like, calm down. Just you, you know what I mean? He's kind of getting. They kept showing him. I was like, I, can you please just sit down? I wasn't watching him at all. No, I didn't really recognize it. Maybe I mean, he, a, he, he he was, was just, just a Jurgen Klopp thing. it up. Yeah. I, and I, I just that's not my style. I don't like that as in a manager. 
Okay. I, well, I'm more of an enchilada. Just sit there in your suit. You've, you've already done the hard work. Let your let your guys, you know, go out and do what you just, constructed, you know? Just raise a single eyebrow whenever you need a comeback. Yes. Yeah. yes. All this yeah. jumping around and flailing your arms, it's, it's silly <laughs> yeah, to me. So funny. He was doing his thing on the sideline, but hopefully uh, at the park we can silence – uh, Dortmund and their traveling supporters and in uh, the manager, they can all just sit down and PSG can celebrate and it'll be quite the celebration. It'll be something to look forward to. We'll see. So I guess, you know, just looking at Dortmund here, they, they actually do have a match tomorrow. We're recording this on Friday. They've, they've got a match on Saturday uh, at home against Augsburg. So if you're and PSG have no game, so if you're looking for some football to watch this weekend, I would tune into that. Uh, Ethan, it's going to be early for us, 7.30 a.m. our time. But it might be interesting to see, you know, what uh, what the manager goes with there in terms of players, and you know, keep an eye if anyone picks up a knock or anything like that. Yeah, and hopefully not. But yeah, something to keep your eye on for this weekend. I bet they sit everyone. If you look at the Bundesliga table um, with the 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 new system for the Champions League next year, there'll be thirty six teams, not thirty two. And they've qualified, um, right? They essentially just did because um, with the the coefficients, the one year coefficient that they're using to see which two countries are going to get a fifth team next year. Um, with their win, I think they only needed a draw, even. Um, and and th- this is going to happen anyway, even if they had lost to us. But uh, Germany officially clinched the fifth uh, spot in the so their fifth place is, will be in the Champions League next year. And right now they're in fifth, and the difference from fifth to sixth is um, they've got a healthy lead, twelve points. Yeah, so it's it's insurmountable. They're locked in at fifth. They have just qualified for the Champions League, I believe, and um, so they have no reason to risk risk guys against Augsburg. I think it'll be all backups for them. And you know what? I wish we had had a game hmm. uh, as well, maybe to. And, and I know a lot of people were thinking, "Oh, Liga is trying to, you know, trying to help the French clubs by rescheduling these games." I don't think it really made a difference, and I kind of wish that we had a game, especially because we've won the league. It's there's no point just put up all put out all backups out there. Maybe you get some match fitness for a lot of guys. Like if we're losing late in the game on Tuesday, and we just had King and Lee go ninety minutes a couple of days before. Then you know he could probably put in a solid twenty five minute shift if he needed to. He'd be he should yeah. be a bit more match sharp. Same with Gonzalo Ramos. Like this is a guy who's yep. in form. He's scoring goals. Put him out mm-hmm. there and yeah. you know let him yeah. see the ball yeah. hit the backs of the net. You know? Yeah, I wish we had had that match against Nice rescheduled, um, but unfortunately it it was. Um, it probably won't end up changing too much, but I don't know. We'll, I guess we'll we'll see, but. Um, yeah, I know. Uh, so I mentioned at the beginning, I'll be at the park on May 12th, so the, the game next Saturday, so in, in eight days. And if we win this on Tuesday, then it's going to be a big party. We're going to lift the league on trophy. We're going to be seeing it, them in their last home match before they um, play in the Champions League final. And, of course, we have two away games in Liga before then, but we'll probably just Rest, guys. Take it easy, especially because the Coupe de France final um, on the 25th or 26th. That's what we're really. Uh, that's that's our next big step after this Dortmund match. But um, yeah, it just I feels guess. good to be playing meaningful football games in early May. Oh, this is great. It's great. Yeah, I was thinking <laughs> that the other day. Yeah, it, was, it, it is nice. And man, I I really think PSG can do it. I mean, if I had to watch the the Barcelona second leg. I had to watch both legs actually on on flights when I was getting married in Arizona. It just the days the the cheapest flights happened to work out to where I was in the air exactly at the same time that both the matches were going on. Um, it was nice, you know, e- easy way to watch the flight. It's like I t- take off, I start watching the game, the game ends, and I land five minutes later. But um, when I was watching that on the the second leg on the flight. At two goals down, I was thinking like, "Dang, I, I think it's over." And we we dug. I mean, with fifty three minutes left in our season, down two goals in Barcelona. And of course, it's not Camp Nou, but at uh, that stadium, at the Olympic Stadium, they're playing at, it's no slouch of an atmosphere. We no. came back from that, 
And they, they yeah. had a red card, but again, not a, every team that goes down a man just gives up four goals, you know? And Yeah, and you know, I think a lot of people have been t- putting too mm-hmm. much of, oh, like without the red card. But it's like, but yeah, the red card, that'd be like saying, well, if you guys like didn't score this goal, it's like, but yeah, we did. It's right. like we, the reason we it was a red card is because it was a goal scoring opportunity. It, it, and- it, it's not like, uh, yeah, it's not like the red card wasn't earned. It's not, you, you don't just luck into red cards for the most part. Barcola cooked unless, that Unless you're back. Real Madrid, then you do you do luck into red cards on other, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you, and you certainly don't get red cards called on you. What's that? Never, what's that, ever. What's that no. stat where Casemiro basically never got called for red in his career? No. Till he even, you know, United? Vinicius yeah. putting his hands on yeah. people's throats, like never. No, they will never get a red card, I'm convinced. I don't remember too much of what happened in that, but um, – I don't. Oh, oh, I, no! You're right. I remember that was a. Uh, it was yeah, earlier this against, uh, this campaign, this Champions League round season. of sixteen against Leipzig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I a lot of people do not like Vinicius Junior. I like him a lot, uh, but but even for me liking him, yeah, that should have been a red. But um, yeah, but yeah, regarding that red card, it's not like we didn't earn it. So of course we can't expect to be playing ten man Dortmund for a lot of the match, but. Um, but we probably won't go down multiple goals. So I guess, you know, there's the difference there. And then we're in a much more favorable spot yeah. uh, going into Tuesday than we were going yes. at Barcelona uh, last month. So I would be shocked if Dortmund came to the park and they scored early. Even at 2-0, if they score early, it's still not insurmountable. But I, I yeah. would just be shocked. I, I just think they're going to, like, settle into the game. And and that's when PSG needed to uh, take advantage. So. So you got 3-1. I've yeah. got 2 nil. Both results would see PSG get to the final. We'll see what happens on Wednesday between Bayern and uh, Real Madrid. They're locked at 2-2. And I think the match is at uh, the Bernabeu, if I'm not mistaken. It, it, it is, yeah. yeah. Are they going to close the roof so they can get more noise? Has, has that come <laughs> up? Did he get approval? I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. So Gosh, stupid. That, that game, and I don't watch a lot of the Champions League outside PSG until the semifinals. So in the past years when we got knocked out, I'm just like quarterfinals, whatever. I'm still upset that we're not in the quarterfinals, so I haven't typically watched them. And then the uh, but the semifinals I always watch because it's like, all right, one of these four are going to win it, and it seems like it's we're really in the thick of like you got to be a very very good team, really on form to be at this in this stage. And uh, that was brutal that that. Kim Min Jae basically conceded both goals for Bayern. If they had a different center back in there, a quicker center back, Bayern really could have won that first leg 2-0. He home. was linked with PSG in the summer, and, and I remember people really wanted him. I would have liked I mean, he's a, I think he came from Napoli. He's a really good defender, but yeah. not after that performance. Kind of glad Bayern's, he's not. <laughs> Bayern center backs have struggled this year. Upa Meccano lately. Mm-hmm. Um Man, I don't I don't watch a lot of Bayern, so if there's any uh, you know Bundesliga fans listening to this, don't take too much stock in this if I'm just way off. But Eric has Eric Dyer been their best center back lately, and they just signed him in January. I think I don't know, Oof. but yeah, weird weird sign. stuff um, from them. So I I don't see them going through after that after that center back disaster class <laughs> at their home stadium. But um, but yeah, I guess if I had to put a prediction on that other one, I'm gonna go like. 2-0 or 3-1 for Real Madrid. I think they'll be in the final. Yeah, I think they'll make the final. And then it'd be amazing if, if PSG makes it Mbappe up against Real Madrid. It, we, it seems like we've been a slow kind of train just chugging along to this point. And uh, that would be something. I've said it before. I think it'd probably be one of the highest rated Champions League finals. It would feel like a World Cup kind of build up to it. I, everybody would be talking about it. So, But we got to get the job done first. PSG... Yeah. We'll host uh, Dortmund at the park. We're like you said before. We're thrilled that PSG are playing meaningful football matches in early May. There's a big one coming up, uh, PSG Dortmund on Tuesday, May seventh. We'll have. I'll try to do a um, an X spaces afterwards, just to kind of people can let their feelings out, or we can celebrate. We we don't know what we're going to be doing, but we'll try mm-hmm. to do a lot more after that match, and hopefully have Ethan back on. Ethan, thanks so much for joining. Appreciate it. We'll catch you next time. Thanks.